This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors, everyone. This is a very special edition, and we're actually going to do a a series of these because we are being joined by the Author Talk Network. So it's really Drinking with the Author Talk Network, not just Drinking with Authors. I'm super excited. So I am your host, Erica Lance. Our sponsor today is Skunk Brothers Spirits. Um, They're a veteran uh, brother-owned spirit company. If you go on their website, skunkbrotherspirits.com, use coupon code DWA10, you get fairly amazing liquors. I'm just going to say I'm drinking one of them today, but I'll discuss in a minute. So my guests today are Grace Salmon, Barbara Conray, and Linda Rosen. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves as a whole new thing and um, what we're drinking. But Grace, why don't you start by talking about the Author Talk Network? Thanks, Erica, and thank you for hosting Author Talk Network. You were so kind to host me when I uh, had my debut novel out, and I remember you and Jen at the time so well. I wanted to come back and bring you Author Talk Network, and you were so great to accept us over a series of three shows, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Author Author Talk Network is a group of 17 authors that all came together because they wanted to collaborate and communicate. And there's just so much to talk about. We are everything from debut novelists to New York Times bestsellers. Barbara, who's joining us today, is a USA Today bestseller. And some of us write professionally full time. Some of us have multiple jobs to uh, keep us afloat while we write. So I love the network because there is so much to talk about around the journey of reading, the journey of writing each of our different paths to publications. And the reading and writing community has really embraced Author Talk Network. We have an ebook coming out. We've got a series of conferences we're doing. And it's just a delight. I think um, I pulled this together because I wanted to work more closely with some specific authors that I knew. And now I, I really think it's mushrooming. It's a lot of fun. No, that is awesome because that is one of the biggest things is that pathways to how to get to where you want to go as an author and a writer um, are not always easy. And I, you know, from doing drinking with authors and stuff, it's never the same. No two people have the same journey that they have and how that works for that person. So I think what you guys are putting together and what you've done is thoroughly amazing. But let's also introduce yourselves as authors as part of this. So Grace, do you want to start again? And talk a little bit about your publishing and what you write? Absolutely. Thank you. So my first three books are in the area of education. I was, prior to being a novelist, I was a high school improvement consultant. I traveled to 32 states uh, around the United States. And so those first three books are nonfiction, very research-based. And then when I thought I was done, I decided to write a novel called The Eaves, and it's about the psychologically complex Jessica Barnett, who thinks her life is done until she meets a group of diverse, determined, and sometimes ditzy old women. And then when their stories are told, everything changes. Very, very cool. Okay, Barbara, what about you? Hey, I am without a doubt a late bloomer. Um, I published my debut at the age of 70. Um, when I turned 71, it um, became a USA Today bestseller. Um, I, my second book is coming out August 23rd. I'm really excited about that. Um, I wrote my first book because I was angry. I was angry at a brain tumor that destroyed, um, a child close relative of a friend of mine. And I didn't know what to do with this anger. And so I did a lot of research about the tumor. It's called glioblastoma. It is considered to be rare. It is considered to only um, mainly touch middle-aged men. I have seen very many children, babies um, die from this. And uh, it really touched me. And like I said, I was angry. So I wrote a book, it is fiction. Um, 
it has been very well received. I've been very fortunate. And as I've said, I am definitely a late bloomer. But um, I'm squeezing those books in just as fast as I can. <laughs> I think that is awesome. Okay, Linda, how about you? I'm also a late bloomer. And I think Barb and I are very proud to talk about that. We are. <laughs> I published my first book in 2020, right before we were the world was shut down by COVID, actually one week before, uh, The Disharmony of Silence at the age of 72. Uh, and my second book came out a year later, um, Sisters of the Vine, when I was 73. And I'm working on my third. I hope to finish my first draft while I'm 74. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> um, my, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, my books are set in the not-too-distant past. They're women's historical fiction. Um, they always... I, I like to explore how women overcome obstacles to succeed, to get what they want or what they should have. Um, I also explore how family is not just blood and they always have a piece of jewelry. In very, very cool. Okay, we have to talk about what we're drinking before I forget because I had a few sips before and it's um i'm drinking <laughs> um <laughs> it's when i explain this this will make sense why so i decided to take skunk brothers has this one spirit and it's called lightning and for me it's it's moonshine it's honey moonshine but for whatever reason it kicks me in the ass i mean i'm just gonna say that so i mixed it with um cranberry and pomegranate juice Ooh. to sort of temper it a little but i can Tell you it's not so tempered as much as I'd like it. <laughs> Woo, so much that, fun. So, that sounds um, like a good drink. It is a really yummy drink. It's just for whatever reason, like I can just sit and sip whiskey and I'm good. Irish descent, like totally this particular moonshine. And I've joked about it on my show before because it was, I took a sip of it the first time and I was like, Whoa! just literally lightning through my body. So it's kind of amazing, but that's what I'm drinking. Grace, what are you drinking? I am drinking seltzer out of this absolutely beautiful uh, tumbler, <laughs> um, but uh, very shortly I will be drinking Dr. Smirnoff or as Dr. I him as Dr. Smirnoff. Dr. Smirnoff, I, I like it. I'm a citrus Smirnoff girl in general, but right now it's just seltzer. Very cool, Barbara. Well, I'm deviating a little bit because I am a wine drinker, but right now I'm drinking a little vodka and tonic, just a little, as you can see. Um, so we shall see how the afternoon goes. Uh, cheers to that. Linda, what are you drinking? Boy, if I had only known sooner, I came out kind of late. <laughs> <laughs> I could lie and say there's all kinds of fabulous things in here, but um, it's embarrassing. I'm a fitness professional turned writer. So I haven't had any water today and I know how important water is. So I've just got hot water in here with honey and lemon, but give me a little while and I'll go get a glass of wine. There you go. I actually, here's my water to go with my drink. Because yes. If I don't, I'll be on the floor in like an hour. It'll be fine. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Linda. I want to ask you because Barbara conveyed how her journey began, but there are many people that I talk to that uh, chose, especially after retirement or some point later in their life, to write a book. What made you finally decide to write and publish a book? I was nearing my 60th birthday when I really felt a pull to do something more creative. I had done all those other creative kinds of stuff, needlework, and, and I was delving into photography quite a bit. So I was actually looking for a photography course when I came across a writer's workshop offered in a local adult school. Now, I never in my life thought I would write a novel. I always thought how fabulous it would be. I'm an avid reader. I've been in book clubs. I loved having the authors come and talk to us at the book clubs. And I thought, oh, God, wouldn't that be the greatest thing to do? I'll never do that. But I took that writer's workshop and my fingers haven't stopped pounding on the keys. 
That is awesome. That is so cool. So what do you, um, and I'll ask questions, what in general, like when you guys started the Author Talk Network, um, Grace, and you're like, I want to work with people, what was the first mission that you wanted to accomplish with that? You know, I'm going to go back to, am I a potter or am I a panther? Um, in some ways, I plan out so many things in my life. With Author Talk Network, I just didn't. I had this sense that there were a group of authors that would be stronger together than they were individually, that we could lift each other up. And I just thought, even if we're just saying, hey, I was on a great podcast, like Drinking With Authors, that would be enough. But what began to happen is we started referring each other as, you know, that was part of my goal. And then we started getting blog posts. People would ask us to show up on a blog post and be a guest on, on that. And then we started doing it collectively. So there's a woman out of Stanford who's asked us to answer a set of questions. There's, it's just really organic. I think I probably need to get together with my other co-authors and figure out where do we go from here because we do have an ebook coming out um, in the month of May. We have a series of 17 different panel topics, which run everything from, you know, the art of ghostwriting, which is called Boo, to down the rabbit hole. So we have 17 different panels that people can engage us on. We go to book clubs, speaker events, conferences. I can't say it's been very strategic, but it's <laughs> been a lot, a lot of work and a lot, a lot of fun. And our website is so simple. It's authortalknetwork.com. You can see all the, I think I said we have 17 authors. We have actually have 19 and you can see each of our bios. You can link to our website. You can see the different panel presentations. So um, not much of a planner on this one, but lots of good stuff happening. Let's can talk add, about, yeah, please, Barbara, add, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing. Grace is the power behind Author Talk Network. She has done so much work. She has done so much to make this gel and honestly there would be no author talk network i sincerely believe this and i know linda that you will agree with me oh, without totally. grace she has done so much um it was her brainchild she pulls us together sometimes she has to reach for us at different places because we just go off the wall but it, it's really she's a joy to work with she is so much fun. She is so gracious and generous with her time, with her talent. And I just wanted you to know that. I well, just want to make will... sure, yes, that you know no, that. She gets, she gets the kudos, but I want to tell you, why did Grace start this? Because she said, you said that you wanted to be with, um, bring the authors together. No, no, no. You wanted to be with me. <laughs> <laughs> when she called me one day and started talking about this idea, it didn't have a name at the time. I thought it was fabulous. Grace, she's an entrepreneur. I mean, that's what she was all her life, an entrepreneur. Not that she's making any money out of this thing, but she's an it entrepreneur. Could it, it could happen. It could happen. It could happen. But, you know, we'll be I dead, knew, Linda, but I it knew could that happen. This, yeah, I just knew this was going to go somewhere. And then she, you just kept at it, Grace. You, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it's fantastic. I I'm, can see us. I mean, my dream is that one of the big conferences, I mean, I, I Barbara, you may have been on the conferences, the AWP conference with yes. me. Yes, and last year. Some other oh, conference. 2020, um, yes. Yeah. And we had another conference. But I I my dream is that Author Talk Network is going to be at like some big writers digest conference or one of those. Because we have a lot to offer. Director of conferences. So Linda's yeah. now director of conferences. That's what okay. <laughs> um, you really you line them up, we... Linda. Yeah, I think we're exponentially better together. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, all, of all course. Of, all of us have gotten more exposure 
because yeah. of this unique idea. And I really, there are big organizations which we're both part of, um, Women's Fiction Writers Association, which is fabulous. There's the Women's National Book Association, which actually also goes back fabulous. to 1917, fabulous. But I don't know, and I'll ask the other three of you, I don't know of anything else where, you know, we don't have a specific company, we don't have a channel for business, but we're all lifting each other up all the time. Yeah, we're referring each other, coming out with an ebook. It was really interesting. We're working with a group called Red Penguin Books, um, which is Stephanie Larkin's company, to have our ebook come out um, in May. And we had a really hard time drafting a contract because there's nobody who's officially able to sign a contract. So we actually just each have to sign our own contract because we don't have an, a corporate entity. But Linda's right that I've started four different companies and I just, I love that part of my brain. I think that's awesome because effectively what you guys have done is create a very public tribe. Yeah. The thing yes. about authors yeah. is that a lot of times, you know, by nature, I think a lot of authors are solitary creatures, right? We write, I mean, generally you can go sit and write with other people. Not a lot of authors can do that, but uh, several do, you know, you can do that, but creating an actual tribe, finding like-minded people to motivate you and bring you forward and do that, I think is unbelievable. And then to make it in a public way where others can find you and find the information versus these little maybe writing group niches, which is great, but it doesn't get you necessarily the wide berth of knowledge you need as an author mm -hmm. to move forward. And I, I think that that's phenomenal about what you guys are doing and then being able to share your different journey. So um, I'm, again, fortunate that I got to interview Grace and pull her story out of her, including the wonderful quilt behind her, drag it out. There was there was there was libations involved. It didn't take a lot of dragging. Yeah. <laughs> but Barbara, you talked about writing because of um, a death, but. Yeah. Your story, for instance, what did you get go traditionally published or self published? I'm traditionally published um, with a small publisher, um, which I cannot speak highly enough about. Um, I've had very good um, experiences with my publisher, which is um, Red Adept. They are also in they are in North Carolina and um, it was the first um, manuscript I ever submitted. It was the only publisher I submitted it to and they accepted it. Um, I've always wanted to be a writer. I just kept putting it off because um, I was either raising a family or working or something. And finally I retired and I said, that's it. I'm actually gonna sit down and the experience I had with um, the woman whose granddaughter died of glioblastoma had actually happened about 10 years before I started writing about it, um, but it never left me. And it gave me that extra little push I needed. I think it was like the story just kept building in my head. And of course in my head, and, and this is the funny thing about writing, in my head, the story was about the child. But as I began to write, the story became about the doctor who, in my book, cured this brain tumor, which of course is fiction because there still is no cure. So the child who died, the real child who died became in my book, the child who only spoke in the prologue and the epilogue from heaven. And really oh, wow. the whole story is about the doctor and how it both ruined and allowed her to live her life because of what she went through in order to create this procedure that would eradicate the tumor. So um, it's not a medical, um, although I did do a lot of research. I actually even watched brain surgery on um, the internet, which I was kind of like peeking in between <laughs> fingers, you know. Um, and I actually did so much research that Johns Hopkins contacted me 
and wanted to know if I was a doctor. And I said, no, but I was doing research for a novel. And they sent me their weekly updates on where they were with research on glioblastoma. So that was um, a wealth of information. And of course, you do all of this research, but very little of it actually shows up in the book. But you need to, in some things, I will let, I will let fiction just have its way. But when it comes to a real thing as important as a brain tumor, whatever I was going to say about that brain tumor had to be accurate. And I, um, a funny story, I, along with the internet, I also did um, research with doctors and I also with um, Johns Hopkins. And I also took a lot of books out at my local library to the point where they started looking at me a little funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, just hope that nobody okay. winds up showing up in a ditch with somebody had performed brain surgery on them, or you're going to get a call. Yeah. I constantly say that. I write horror novels. I I have my friends all laid out to show up at the police station if something was to happen. Oh, because I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. bad. It's really yeah. bad. My <laughs> I totally think, Barbara, you should speak at Johns Hopkins Medical Conference. Oh, you think, you think I should? I <laughs> put Linda in charge of that. Linda, make sure. They would questions <laughs> well, I but i still think they should all be reading the book anyway it would be good and it's interesting that you talk about the research part because i think in order to communicate about something you have to come from a place of understanding yeah right and i was actually having this conversation two days ago with a potential um author to come on the company on board the company and i'm doing a series of lectures actually at my work, I was asked before I depart called, so you want to write a book now what, right? Mm. <laughs> like, um, and it's really because they wanted, they were talking about how they want to write, they want to write sci-fi, but they think they're going to write fantasy because you could make up fantasy. And I'm like, fantasy is exactly like science fiction. Like you can make it up. It's just, if you try to change what, like, and I made the reference to a toaster and how a toaster works, right? I don't care how fancy a toaster you get, for the most part, they all have, work the same. You know, it's just how the heat elements get to warming the bread, right? Well, it's a little oven this way, or you drop them in, you push a button, whatever fancy toast slides through and dumps out the other end. It's a toaster, right? It's if you go into sci fi and then say the toaster, doesn't do that and it does this other weird thing that's when people break and go that's not science that's not how that works right? right but you can make up how things work in the future as long as you don't try to go this is exactly how a toaster advances in the future and this is how it works because that's when fans get pissed off but a lot of science fiction to me is like fantasy in space you know like <laughs> It's, it's similar, right? But, you, but you have to keep track of how that works. But if you're talking about something, and I, I talk about this because I wrote a short story for a book and I was talking in Boston and I sent it to my editor and the person had a car and was driving around, right? And they're like, that, no, that's not how that would happen. There's trains. I had to go look because where I was putting these things, there were train stations and all this other stuff. And they're like, this is how this person would probably get around. It wouldn't be like this in the parking. And it's kind of like, if you go, they have their car and they park in New York city. Anyone who's been to New York city knows the likelihood they have a car and are parking. You know what I mean? Like they're not pulling up in front of their house and it just walking up. Like it doesn't work like that. And so if you don't do research, you lose, even if you don't use all of the research and understanding where the L is and all this other stuff, it won't make sense to the reader. The reader can tell that you don't know what you're talking about. Yes. And that's, that was the thing I worried about most was my medical research. And the thing that I treasure the most is the number of nurses, especially who have written to me to tell me that I had it spot on, not just the medical part, but how my protagonist let her life be ruled by her need to find a cure. That, oh. I mean, they literally told me that they knew people like that. 
They knew people who allowed their lives to be destroyed just so they could find a cure. And that amazed me because on the other hand, I've also had people who absolutely hated my um, main character so much, but yet still liked the book. Um, so she was one of those love you, hate you kind of people, which I actually kind of enjoyed, you know, that she got it, it, any response, negative or positive, is actually a good response in my book. Um, it's true. And it, your character was real. That's yeah. the difference is if your character is easily dismissed, that means you didn't make them real enough that somebody could form an emotional attachment one way or the other to that yeah. particular character. Yeah. Some of my favorite characters in books are the ones that I love to hate, right? Or yes. I get agitated with or annoyed with, but they, their journey is fantastic. Whether or not I'm like, oh my God, you are the worst person in the entire world. You, you still can. I mean, how many characters do you read in books that you don't even remember the name of the character? When you get to the book, you can go, is that a good book? But you don't go, I remember this character's name was Katniss Everdeen, blah, blah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just made a Hunger Games oh, reference. That would be like but... a great name for a character. <laughs> it would Where be. Where did that come from? Maybe, maybe like in a, in a restaurant book or something. Because right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm feeling kind of hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, so let's talk that you you touched on it, Barbara, but I'm going to throw it over. Linda. Let's talk about fan feedback. So you decided, you know, because you could, I'm sure have a lot of forethought into the fact that COVID was going to hit. You're talking to me? I had no yeah. idea. No, no I'm sure. I've, I've talked to several people who've released books right before COVID hit. One of them, a friend of mine, released a book that was about a contagious virus. Oh, lovely. She, and it was all set up to go. And like, it was launching. It was already done. It wasn't like she wrote it. And, and then it launched March 16th. Oh, wow. The well, so I launched on March, on March 5th. And on March 6th, I had a book launch party at a local bookstore, which sadly is no longer there. Oh. We had 75 people at oh. this bookstore. It was thrilling. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. One week later, we hear about COVID. And I was worried. Oh, my gosh. What were we doing in that? Thankfully, nobody. Because only one person I didn't know who came out of that 75. So I hope she never got it, but thankfully nobody did. But I will tell you that because of COVID, authors came together. Mm -hmm. We had something called the 2020 debuts, which we made um, from the Women Fiction Writers Association. We had a Facebook group. Barbara keeps us going, even though it's two years later. Um, two other fabulous authors, Slaney Cameron and Allison Hammer started it. That kept, that brought us out there. And uh -huh. without it that, did. I don't think any one of us would have connected as much. And truthfully, as horrendous and awful and tiring as COVID is, it does have its, it did, it does have its silver linings. Yeah. It really did. It's true. That's true. And I'm glad you brought up the 2020s because they have been so important. Phenomenal. And, and they still are. We're still. Oh, yeah. We are we're still, still supporting, supporting each other. Well, that's know? the whole thing. You touched on it, because Erica, because we do. We write private. We write on our own. We're private. I mean, even if you go to a coffee shop and write, you're not talking to the other people. You're in your own world. And I had no idea I was going to make new friends and be in a community. I made friends with my characters. That was it. I, I didn't know I was going to be in a community. And I've made such phenomenal friends in the past two years that I truly call friends. And have. I know I've been in touch with more readers than I ever would have been if it mm -hmm. hadn't been um, for this coming together. Mm -hmm. And the Author Talk Network is doing that to us because we love talking to readers. I mean, yeah. why else are we writing it? We love talking to readers. And it's easier for us to talk to readers when there's more than just one of us. True. That's how I feel. Yeah. That's how yeah. I feel. I need, like, what did I just say to Grace? I'm a 
I feed off of people. I'm not the feeder. <laughs> yeah. Except I will go to book clubs by myself, but I'd love to have yeah. them along. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Linda, that's how I met you was at the 2020s. Right. With the 2020s. You know? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back with Drinking With Authors. Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay, we're back. We're going to talk about um, readers now. So, Grace, what have you seen as a difference since you started the Author Talk Network in relation to talk, hitting and reaching out to readers? Because a lot of what you're talking about is content for writers, but let's talk about readers. Really, the access. It's the idea that more and more readers are interacting with us because there's more books to look at. So it's not just a matter of looking at my book and interacting with me when somebody says to me, you know, I really, really loved your book. It, it speaks to my soul. I might say, oh, you know, Linda Rosen wrote this book also where these two women, you know, they really joined together and they're out in the vineyards and you might like that. So I think that the way we've connected with readers has been, um, different and, and just more, which is really what feeds our souls. You know, Erica, you're a writer, you're, you own your own publishing firm. You know that that is the essence of how we interact. One of the things I see personally with readers is I have many more reviews, which I love. You know, I, I am somebody who reads my reviews. I'm grateful that um, the Eves is tracking at about 4.7 stars across every platform. Uh, but I remember about a year ago, somebody wrote a book, uh, I'm sorry, wrote a review, and they just put one star and they signed their name Patricia. And we talk about how you're in a book, you know, you read a book, you don't remember the name of the characters. I can tell you they're fabulous reviews, obviously at 4.7 stars, and they touch my heart and they may make me cry. I probably don't remember who exactly wrote it. But I still want to know why Patricia gave me one star. <laughs> Who is Patricia? Well, it's, I actually did a Facebook post about it that said, like, "Who are you, Patricia? Let me know," because I want to learn from readers. I don't think any book is for everybody, right? No. Uh, we talked a little bit about genre before. I didn't think I used to like to read sci-fi or um, some fantasy work until I read the work of Nola Nash and a few other people. Um, uh, oh, there's a wonderful woman, DC Gomez. And I was like, oh yeah, this, her main character is a talking cat. I am not gonna be reading a book about a talking cat. And I love DC Gomez's work. So I have a lot more reviews, which both teach me more about what I should do or want to do as a writer and also uh, expose me to more readers. So that's a very important part of what I like. Also, the three of us are part of a Facebook group called Bookish Road Trip. And we have 3,500 members and we are very reader focused. So we tend not to tout our own work. We're very structured. So every Friday, an author can come on. We're very, very and we're understood. Our Mary, are you listening? <laughs> for all those people who can't see us, we're all going, oh my gosh, we are so <laughs> ridiculously structured. <laughs> on Fridays, authors get to brag about whatever they're doing. And we want to do that because readers like it. And I want to know, oh, Barbara will say that she was just on Drinking With Authors podcast. And I'll say, oh, I want to be on that podcast. That sounds good. But we also want to make sure that we have a monthly book club, which Barbara hosts. Tonight, we're doing a meetup, uh, and it's just a half hour, 45 minutes, whatever it turns into, on the Facebook group, because we want people to interact with us. Obviously, there's a side benefit that if they love us, they'll want to read more of our books. But we, you know, we're all bookish people, readers, writers, we're just hanging out. And travelers. The thing with Bookish Road Trip is it's a reader 
author traveler kind of so we talk about traveling we talk about writing we talk about reading we combine it all together and yes it is very structured but it's also a lot of fun and it's also a way to put us all out there without saying look at me you know it's not look at me it's look at us yes. and that is so much better i think i mean that's what i like about author talk network that's what i like about bookish road trip um that's even what i like when i host the book clubs because it's like i'm saying look at this author you know i'm not saying look at me but i'm there you know they <laughs> see me you know She's really but short, you know, She's really yeah, short. I am really yeah. short. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, even before I became a novelist, I loved doing that. When I would read a book, you know, you recommend it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, I loved promoting other authors Me also too. Me um, too. as a reader. And part of the thing with readers, you know, you, your girlfriend, you speak to what books do they know about? It's only what, what they're hearing, what they're seeing advertised, what's in the New York Times, you know, that kind of reader. The more we are all together and the more that's done actually in cyberspace, these podcasts and Facebook or whatever, people realize there are so, so many other books out there that are wonderful. And that's what I love when I talk to readers or, you know, somebody messages me um, about my book or, you know, I want to read it. I just heard about it. Um, it's, it's wonderful because they realize there's so many other books out there. Yeah. And I think one of the things, so there's things you guys all said, so I have to get, try to remember and touch on all of them. <laughs> uh, me to that okay one of the things you said grace was you started reading outside your genre and i think that's so important and especially for anyone listening to this podcast read outside your genre try it and don't just try one and go no i don't like it because every book in a genre can be very different so be willing to try it because you think like I know people who go, oh, Westerns, uh, right? But there are some Westerns you might absolutely love because the plot and the storyline and things right. like that, you know, you don't have to be a cowboy or like Texas to go read uh, Western. I'm, I just totally made that up. For the record, no hate mail. I know that <laughs> Westerns take place in other states in Texas. I was just making a point, you know? <laughs> <laughs> ah, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know westerns are in other states like i can already hear it playing so uh, wyoming uh, whatever yeah uh, montana um arizona new mexico i live there um how many states we can name that are in the western part of the country <laughs> Never don't do that. That's so geography. Don't do that to me. Really. Listen, we're not teaching people things on this podcast no just kidding <laughs> but the other thing that I think is really true is, um, you know, if you just go around going, look at me, talk to me, look at me, talk to me, instead of building up the community, none of us are writers that are writing enough to feed a, a reader. Yeah. Like, you know, collectively, you may be able to help feed a reader, but as an individual, you will never keep a reader satisfied. So if you don't keep them in the family or in the group or in the network or whatever you want to call it, and they go off and find somebody else, if it takes you a year, which is great for a book or two years or three years, there are some people I know that do 10 books in a year, which is phenomenal, but they're the exception, not the rule. You're going to lose that reader if you don't keep them in your community with you. And go, here are other people that you can read here want to talk about because it's not just all about you. It just That's simply excellent. isn't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. You know, and I think what you guys have are doing and creating and a part of is fantastic, especially what about you, Linda? How are you published? Oh, I'm with a small press for both of my books and planning on doing it again for number three. 
Yeah. Very cool. Was it, was it just like Barbara's where you were like, I wrote this beautiful manuscript. It's perfect. I'm picking my publisher. I'm sending it in. It's oh, done. if only. Yeah. If only. Yeah. I was, I was, I was yeah. really, I was really lucky. And I point that out every time I tell that story. Yeah, you are. You I, are. I was especially lucky. Yeah, so I have to brag on Barbara because not only did she pick her, and I think Barbara, you were probably smart. You did your research, you figured out which publisher would be a most likely match as opposed to me going, oh, let's just throw spaghetti against the wall and see what works. That's what I did. <laughs> but not only did Barbara hit it right the first time, for all of those people who want to be agented, Barbara's agent came to her and said, hi, could I please represent you? Yeah, again, most of right. us who go uh, again, that. I was really lucky. It's like, and, and, you know, I mean, okay, just between us, we're not going to tell anybody this. <laughs> no, we're only on a podcast. Right. Right. This will be a little <laughs> secret. Right. I know. You know, it was like, I was just really lucky. And I have been lucky, and trust me, I have been unlucky. I mean, I have been through my whole Fifty Shades of Hell. So, you know, it's not like God spit me out and said, let the sun shine on you for the rest of your life. That is not it. But in those two instances, yeah. I have been very lucky. And yes, my agent is Liza Royce with, well, Liza Flessig with, Liza Royce agency and she is fabulous and I've been lucky I've just been lucky but I do want to make a point here and I'm thrilled for you that Thank she came you. to you after your book was published without an agent I don't know about you Erica um Grace mentioned you have your own publishing company yeah um Four Horsemen Publications we actually have a new imprint uh, accomplishing mm -hmm. innovation press that we do nonfiction and stuff we do oh. mainly series based authors in the Four Horsemen Publications like people who want to get a lot of work out there and then um we're actually doing dissertations now and oh my gosh um non books and stuff through accomplishing innovation press because I, my publishing company was started because I want to bring about the publishing apocalypse because I'm really tired of how publishing works in general and how publishing treats authors and I and I love finding other publishing houses that are doing great things like hearing about that that's fantastic. But I have to say that again the exception and not the rule to what I hear about even with very more famous authors I will say that have published for a long time and been there like. We had um, one, uh, Melinda Snodgrass, she's a, a very well, she's best friends with George R. R. Martin. I mean, these guys have published for years and years and years. She went to put a three book series out. The publishing company published two of her books and then went, we're not going to publish the third. And they put it under the wrong genres and stuff like that. Oh, uh, and you can't oh, publish bad. the third one. And yeah, it's, it's awful. Yeah. Well, and I'm helping her with that, but the oh, fact good, is, good. <laughs> is that that happens more frequently than people realize. So when you find a good small press, I love hearing about that. I mm -hmm. love that. And I love good small presses because other people do get ideas to start a publishing company without researching and realizing what that takes. And they hit a crest and then fall and they don't end up paying their authors or the books get tied up and there's a lot of stuff that goes to it. So doing research is amazing. But yes, I started a publishing company because I was tired of how it was working. I was tired of how, how the query letters worked. It, it really hit me. And I, I've said this on the podcast before. I got a, a query letter rejection back that was a copy of a copy of a rejection letter. Oh, you wow. can tell that it wasn't like, yeah. I mean, to me, it doesn't take that much to print them go down to kinkos or whatever and copy them if you don't have a copy machine but this was literally a copy and you could tell then it was like kind of tilted that it was a copy of a copy and i'm like that actually is just a punch in the face to an author yeah yeah you know yeah well i did go the query route as you had asked earlier um and then i got frustrated with it and i wanted to actually because i was hearing about all these other people that were 
published by small presses, I did my research on small press and I came up with Black Rose writing. And I, I, I don't even remember a few others that I, you know, you know, submitted to, but Black Rose, thankfully, took me. I was thrilled. And they're very, very collaborative. But what I'm trying to point out is we are not agented. Barbara is now. But here's four of us who were not agented. Um, people start out writing and they think they have to have an agent. Go for it if that's what you want. But the way the business is right now, and it is so political also, that you can, there are so many wonderful small presses out there. I mean, we know so many authors with different presses mm -hmm. that you can be very happy with them. Mm -hmm. You can. It's and I true. think it, it, it's again, what is the journey that you want to have? I have friends that got agents and, and authors I know that I that got agents, for instance, that the agents didn't do anything mm -hmm. for them, even though they right. got the agent, right? Well, then that doesn't mean you're getting your book published either. Right. No. <laughs> no, exactly. it doesn't. And you're giving up some of your profits. If they work for That's you right. and they do what you need, yay! There's some amazing agents out there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Also. On the flip side, you can always hire the administrative person, that contact person that helps you get your social media up and all of that stuff. That's that's money better invested is to get somebody <laughs> to go the direction of helping you if you're not familiar with all of the wonderful things that the interwebs have presented to us to get your communications out there. You know, and I think you brought up a point about COVID. I mean, the the death, the loss of life, and the that stuff, horrifically horrible, right? Horrible. I will say though, I think it forced the advance of some ways to communicate and stuff like that, that wouldn't have gone as fast as it did. Like in, in when it happened, I'll tell you when COVID happened, I had launched the podcast before COVID happened and we were doing in-person recordings. Um, and I had a co-host, his name was Austin. He was amazing, right? And we were doing in-person recordings with people on the podcast. We had a bar that sponsored us. Unfortunately, went out of business during the podcast. It was um, called Waypoint in Florida. But um, And then all of a sudden, we couldn't do that anymore. So I had to scramble. And we started using Skype, to be honest with you. And that was not the easiest. It was very grainy, like was not. And then all of a sudden Zoom came in and Zoom was like, you know what? I know everybody kind of used this sometimes, but ah, and now you're going to you know, <laughs> use this. And I, I think that's true in channels to talk about. And now um, these things are normal. These kind of meetings, these kind of things are a normal thing and not the exception. Right. So people can look for them which I think has made, it's very different than it was two years ago. You know? True. And, and it gives isolation. us so many more platforms to talk about books, to bring ourselves out, to talk with readers. There are so many more than just going to your local bookstore. I mean, I was, one of the it's things I had said was, right? I went wants. to more places across the country with my debut novel than I ever, ever would have if we were always all in person I would have gone to my local library and you know that would have been it and, exactly uh, what were you saying Grace well I think it's made everybody more accessible the way I would say that I didn't even do enough research on how to get my book published you know I read books and one of the tips that I had read in some how to get your book published thing was Go to the library or the local bookstore, find books that are like yours, doesn't even matter, you know, read the back and then go to the back where the author thanks their agent. And if you think that book is like your book, go and write to that agent and say, oh, my book is so much like this book. I bet you'd love to be my agent. Well, <laughs> that's, you know, that's a, for me, it was a pathway to hell. It, it went nowhere. Um, and Linda brought up a good point, you know, even if you get an agent, you have a 1% chance of getting public. I think you have a, let me just get the stat right for a second. You have a 10% chance of getting an agent and a 1% chance of getting published after that, I think is the roughly the current stat. So I think that if you are um, 
unpublished at the moment, you need to look at the breadth of how to get published. And what Zoom has done for us, and quite honestly, COVID has done for us, is have us learn more about the individual presses that are available, the individual paths to publication, the accessibility is where I was going. I was um, very, very new. I was the person who said, I'm never going to be on social media. I'm going to write my book. An agent's going to pick it up. Morgan Freeman is going to play <laughs> Tobias. Jessica, um, Sandra Bullock is going to play Jessica, and it's going to be great, and I'll never have to go on Facebook. Well, that's just not the way it works. I'm on Facebook all the time, but I heard an interview that Annie McDonald with the um, Right View View was doing with Julie Valerie, who was one of the co-founders, uh, one of the four co-founders of Bookish Road Trip. And I went, oh my gosh, that woman is brilliant. And I like screwed up all my courage and I sent her a direct message. And I said, would you ever have like five minutes to talk to me? Because I can't figure out what to do with social media. You know, I didn't know what the little ellipse dots in the corner of a Facebook post were. And she like called me that night and we just chatted while she was on carpool picking up her kids. So none of that, which is what I think both Linda and Barbara were saying, none of that would have happened if it wasn't for social media. Um, we're all friends with Julie Cantrell, who is a New York Times bestseller. That woman is on social media more than anybody and, and so well she's she makes my head explode too she she writes bestsellers new york times bestseller usa today bestseller she's kind she is always accessible she's part of author talk network but i don't know the other the rest of you has that been a big surprise to you the accessibility of everybody stunned yeah stunned because okay i'm gonna admit it I was that reader who would go, oh, wow, Hank Phillippe Ryan. And then Hank and I, you know, it's fine. We know each other. We're buddies now. <laughs> you know, that kind of that kind of thing. We're all human. We are all human. It's like, you you know, when you were in school and your teacher, yeah, and you met her in the bakery and it was like, oh, my God, that's the same woman that's behind the desk. You know, she actually goes to the bathroom. Or, you know, <laughs> Shops. Oh my God. Well, shops. But we are all human. And I love the fact that I am now in touch with people and know people who are well published. I don't care, one of the big four or small press or whoever. And we are all the same. And that's the beauty of it. And I think also the more we react, we the more in touch we are with readers. Um, readers enjoy that. I know I do as a reader. I want to see that author the same. You know, she's not, you know, some highfalutin person or he. I want to see them the same. Okay, true. I mean, you know, maybe if I met Hemingway, it would be a different story. <laughs> if you're meeting Hemingway, we have many more problems than I know. just the fan-based situation, just for the record. We'll discuss that another Yes. We ha we're having a zombie apocalypse is what is occurring <laughs> in me having. <laughs> but that's, that's part of it. And it's really, I was surprised at how people come together in this community. And it's really a small community, as big as it is. And as many people are out there who are writing and reading, it's a small community. It's true. And I think one of the things, it was very funny when I first started drinking with authors. So I started my publication company at the beginning of 2020. We have over 400 titles out now. So wow. we've been a little bit wow. busy, but um, one of the things that was interesting is when I started drinking with authors and all of a sudden we were inside and we had to do things, right? I was, I, you know, I surprisingly got drunk one night with my co-host, Valerie at the time and we're like let's just start writing people like I wrote Stephen King I just started pulling up like lists of people to write and it was funny Stephen King's person got back and goes he would love to do the podcast he's booked with certain things like I've had so many you know quote-unquote famous authors on my podcast just by going hey Jonathan Mayberry's been on there twice and I just went Hey, do you want to be on my podcast? He's like, yeah, he loves the podcast. You know, That's he great. has so much fun with us. I'm actually going to hang out with him at Dragon Con this year when we go, because he's like, come meet all the writers. And I think that people don't realize how, for the most part, there are some extreme examples who are a little full of themselves, but this community 
loves what exactly what you said we want to interact with the readers we want to like i watch sometimes people walk past tables of famous authors and they're like oh my god there's this person i'm like mm-hmm. just walk up and say hi they love that just go talk to them we want to hear from you what you love what you hate i had the funniest experience so tampa bay comic-con Last year kind of opened when they thought things were okay and then everything closed down again, you know. But it opened and I was at Tom Bay Comic Con and I was walking through, we all had masks on and somebody stopped me and was like, are you Erica from Drinking With Authors? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And they were like, oh my God, can I get your picture? And <laughs> It's a great it was feeling. Like a fan moment. It was ridiculous. I'm like, yeah. somebody recognizes me from drinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's so silly to me. But at the same time, they were so excited. I think we all love that. We want you to be excited about yeah. what we're doing, right? Absolutely. I, I love hearing from a reader about my book mm-hmm. or, yes. or, or anything. If she saw my me on a pod, heard me on a podcast or read something else that I did. I love that. I'm not writing these just to sit at my computer and put out words. I'm re- writing to get my story out, but to connect with a reader. That's very cool. Very cool. Okay. So I'm going to ask you all a question and then you're going to do shameless self-promotion individually and for the author talk network. So I'm going to start with Barbara. Oh, what I'm is what one... do that? Yeah. I <laughs> It's because you didn't want me to. I felt it. I felt the cosmos. Um, (laughs) What is one thing that you did not expect at all about publishing? Like even with all your research and stuff, what is one thing you just thoroughly did not expect and would want to tell people about? One thing. Um, And this is a personal thing. Okay. I... um, don't take criticism well. And I, I mean, I really don't take it well. So when I first handed in my, now I had readers for my first manuscript and um, they, I asked them to be honest and they were, and they were also kind and very helpful and I felt no angst. I totally sucked it in. I totally found a, a side of myself that I really like, a, a side of myself that is open to learning because that's what I'm all about. And I've now worked with four different editors on my two books between um, content edits and line edits. And I literally suck in what they say. Um, not that I've not disagreed maybe with something, but for 99.9% of it, I agree with what they're telling me. They know more than I do. And I am still learning. So, and this makes me very proud of myself that I can be open. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, Grace, what about you? Say that big premise of my book comes from the fact that I thought I was done. You know, I had had the big career. I owned the companies. I did all this. And I just thought I'd write this book and I was done. But the surprise for me is that my characters taught me I'm not at all. I never thought I'd have my own radio show. I never thought I would think, oh, Author Talk Network, that's a, that's a smart thing. Let me start that. Um, I'm starting, uh, and we can talk about it now because we're taping before we're launching, but I'm creating another late radio show called Launchpad. And it's going to be to help authors launch their book. So a lot of debut novelists who will come on and share. So it's a really different kind of podcast format called Launchpad. I apparently I'm not done. And that was the surprise to me. I wrote the book, figured I was done. And I wake up every day now. Uh, the amount of work, that's the other part of it. I think all three of us would say we are shocked at the amount of work it takes to be an author that has mm-hmm. nothing to do with producing your next book. Yep. But yeah, Absolutely I'm not done. True. And I'm delighted. I'm 68 years old. I'm not done. And I would love for listeners 
to say, even no matter where you are on that journey, you're not done. There, there, there's the next chapter, no matter where you are. There's the next chapter. Very cool. Linda. I'm so glad you let me go second because I could just say ditto. <laughs> You're not allowed to say third, ditto. Actually, I went there, third. Are, there are guidelines for drinking with authors that say <laughs> one rule, you can't say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, when you first presented the question, I was going to say, well, we've already talked about it because what I never expected was to form a community and have new friends that I cherish and have brought me into a whole new stage of my life. And to feed off of grace is not done. Yeah, I thought I was, I mean, I hoped I would write a, I, I knew I was writing a second book because they were both going on it pretty much at the same time I would write one and put the other one away. And I hoped I had a third in me and I do. And now I hope I have a fourth in me. Um, but I never expected to make a life out of it. I thought I'd be writing books. I never realized I'd have an entire new life out of it. And that's what I love. It's a whole new life. That mm -hmm. is amazing. Okay, shameless self-promotion time. I will let you guys shamelessly promote yourselves. I'm all about shameless self-promotion and the Author Taught Network. Who would like to go first? <laughs> you see how I did that, Barbara? I yeah. asked who wanted to go first. <laughs> <laughs> And you're not volunteering, so now I'm going to pick. Grace, you're going first. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Morgan Freeman and Sandra Bullock still need to be in my novel, The Eves, make it a movie, make it Netflix. Uh, so self yeah, check out my website. There's so many fun things that we're doing. So it's Grace Salmon said like the fish, but not spelled like the fish, S-A-M-M-O-N, gracesalmon.net. All of my podcasts are there, recipes, music, fun stuff. And join us on Bookish Road Trip. If you're launching a book, come launch your book with me on Launchpad and Mary Helen Sheriff. So lots of good stuff. You could DM me and we could chat. There you go, Linda. Okay, I am really excited because just the other day I found out that the audiobook from my second book, Sisters of the Vine, just released. So if you're an audiobook reader, you can get it on Audible or actually on iTunes. I didn't know iTunes had books, but I'm very excited. Both my books are um, in paperback, ebook, and Audible, The Disharmony of Silence and Sisters of the Vine. And you can read the first chapter and part of the second uh, for both books on my website, linda-rosen.com. And like Grace, I've got all my podcast, you know, all the podcasts up there and interviews. Um, and other fun stuff. And so even some of the flash fiction and short stories that I've written are linked in there too. Um, and I actually, I challenged myself. I don't know how I came about this, but when I first started writing, I challenged myself to meet with a hundred book clubs. Well, I've met with about eight. <laughs> so if you want to be number nine or number 10, <laughs> get in touch with me. I'm trying to get that. I'm just make today. I was working on making a whole new headier, you know, banner for my Facebook page. And I want to get rid of that hundred book, you know, book club challenge because it's a bit much. But if I ever do it, I'm coming back on your show. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, Barbara and Libby, you should both come on my show individually too. Absolutely. I, I would love that. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, Barbara, yeah. You, you got to go last here, my friend. I yeah, see how you manage that. I, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, nowhere near goodbye. USA Today, it's nothing to, you know, it, it was like the best and worst week of my life because it was just so stressful. Um, my second book I'm really excited about. It is the story of my heart. It comes out August 23rd. Uh, it is called My Secret to Pete. My website also is very easy to find. It is Barbara Conry, C-O-N-R-E-Y, author.com tell us a little bit about me, about my books, about things I'm involved in. Um, I also 
would love to appear at your book club. <clears throat> I appeared at Linda's book club because she right. so graciously had me. And somehow I thought book clubs would be easy. Didn't we all think book clubs would be I easy? I really thought so. I mean, I don't know. When I had a book club, which has not happened in several years, but when I belonged to a book club, I we had authors as often as we could because everybody loved them but for some reason and and you know it has nothing to do with like the the COVID being careful because we can do it via zoom and nobody has to worry and I, I will honestly all of the book clubs other than the one Linda invited me to I have gotten through my daughter who uh, belongs to a great book club and they've invited me and through word of mouth, other friends of hers who have different book clubs, they've invited me and that's the only way and I'm not even sure I'm up to eight. So you may have me beat Linda. But, but um, can I say something about that? I don't want to take away from your shameless promotion though. Okay, that's quite all right. Okay. I share with you. Okay, I think part of the book club issue, we're all with small presses and small presses have a, don't necessarily get your books into bookstores. I know mine is a pay a print on demand. Um, a lot of bookstores do not want to take that. That's true, but I Amazon and and God help me, I am not promoting Amazon over individual <laughs> bookstores. However, they are the biggest bookseller. Oh, that's where you all know, my sales are. That's where my sales are from. And they're and mine too, because yes, I've got my books in two or three um, book small bookstores. And I literally had to sell my eldest child to do it. You know, no, I didn't. Oh, I they, hope you they get were them very, back by Mother's they, Day. They were very gracious. <laughs> they were very great. The, the two or three that I have books in, they were very gracious. Yeah. Uh, and I've actually done book signings there too. That's but, right. um, yeah, you know, so like I said, I'm excited. My dream is just to keep writing, um, and connecting with readers. And, um, I'm, I love when people, um, when my books mean something to someone, when, when they touch somebody's life or somebody's heart and that's my shameless self-promotion. I like it. We're going to do author talk network, but I just going to throw this out there as somebody who has a person that's designated to reach out to small bookstores and Barnes and Noble. If you're an author, go into them. If your stuff is print on demand, they will totally Barnes and Noble will totally get it. It just depends on where it is print on demand. If you're, if you are Amazon only or one of those things that doesn't work, but if you have it through Ingram yeah. slash lightning slash slash course source, um, I can tell you because we distribute through CoreSource, which is the same place Macmillan and Harper Collins and stuff like that distribute. Print on demand is way more of a way to go now because it's also eco-friendly in a way because you're not doing all these books that have to be in a warehouse, blah, blah, blah. So you, but as an author, you have to represent yourself. You have to go oh, in and talk to them and do that and go, hey, how do I get here? The same is true with conferences. I jokingly say, if you're going to try to be Marilyn Monroe in a soda shop and hope somebody's going to come along and go, you have a book. I want to do all these amazing things for you. You know, that doesn't happen. That is, you have to go out. And if you think Barnes and Noble, or if there happens to be a books a million or any of the couple chains that still exist, but it's true with your library too. If you go to your local library yeah. and go, Hey, I published a book, blah, blah, blah. They'll They'll look it up and they'll get your book, but you have mm -hmm. to go talk to them about it. They That's love, so trust me, bookstores love doing book signings because it gets people to come into the store that there's an author in the store. Grace, the you libraries, yeah, the libraries are wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Your local yeah. libraries and all, they're wonderful. They'll have you in, they'll have your books. The, li the libraries are fabulous. Yes. Yeah. And Erica, you pointed out something that's like a, a little hidden secret about publishing that I did not know. So when I was published, I got the magic ISBN number, you know, and before I, since I was traditionally published prior with my first three books, 
you know, I thought the ISBN number, there was like some secret librarian in the Library of Congress who decided, <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, Grace Salmon has written another book. Let us assign her this beautiful ISBN. Well, when we, with my hybrid publisher, and we, we published through Kindle Direct, which is Amazon, you, you know, you go buy an ISBN number and that was a little disheartening that there wasn't a librarian at the Library of Congress. But <laughs> when we wanted to get it into indie bookstores, we just bought another ISBN number, slapped it into the same book, and now you can order it because it's more financially beneficial to a small indie um, bookstore or a Barnes & Noble. So they order it under one ISBN number where it's print on demand through Amazon at another. Little yes. Secret of publishing. It is a secret of publishing. I will also tell you ISBN numbers can be bought in bulk. Yes. So if you're planning, if you go to do that and you're planning on <laughs> publishing more than one version, because you need an ISBN for all the versions of your book, ebook, audiobook. You don't, yeah. if you just go through like Amazon or Barnes and Noble, you, you don't even have to have an ISBN number. But if you do, and that's for another time, because I could get into the Library of Congress and the LCCN numbers you can get assigned to the books. And also going through copywriting and why you there's no such thing as poor man's copywriting. If you ever want to sue somebody, you actually have to copyright your book, which is $65 and a horrible website to be on. But you can copyright it, which is different than the Library of Congress as well. So much fun in education, but we're not going to wrap the podcast with that because that would be <laughs> boring as crap. Who wants to talk about the Author Talk Network, though, before we go? That would be great. Oh, I think Grace gave us a whole load of everything with Author Talk Network. She did, but it's the same list, shameless self-promotion. Okay, okay. well, we, we've got a wonderful website, authortalknetwork.com. And I know from Grace's website and mine, lindarosen.com, probably yours too, Barbara, you can connect through our websites also. Mm -hmm. Everything's on there. The download, we can you can download all the ideas that we have of our um, panels that we'll do. Uh, we've And you know what? We all come from different backgrounds and different genres. Mm -hmm. So- And all of that's come, there. Yeah. And when we come, it's not just all about writing or, or, you know, it's not all about the book. It's who we are and- where we've been in our lives that we also will bring into it. That is exciting. You guys have been, this has been so much fun. This has been so much fun doing it this way. Oh, New for so me. Because this was a little break from your normal thing. So we all got yeah. out of the box a little. Yeah. Yes. Comfortably out of the box. So the barber seemed a little off when I, you know, called her out earlier. Just going to throw that out there. No, well, I want you to know the three, the three of us are on together uh, the last Tuesday of every month yeah. at 8 15 a.m. Eastern time with Coffee with the Crew on yes. Facebook. Ooh. And then we hop over to Instagram for another half hour. We yeah. may not have makeup on. We may not look away. You too. always do, but I don't necessarily at 8.15 in the morning. I do. But <laughs> we just chat. It's bookish chat. And we love to have people come and chat with us. Mm -hmm. Coffee with the crew. And mm -hmm. I swear it's getting more and more popular every time yeah. we do it. Don't you think? Coffee with the it's crew. Like people are really like, you know, because it's like you can just pop in for a few minutes, say hi. And, That's right. You know, and we just and it is totally ad lib, which is great because between, oh, totally. between the three of us, we are great at ad libbing. <laughs> I would agree with that. I would agree. That's why everything I do is ad libbed. People try to yeah. give me scripts, and I'm like, that is a terrible idea. Just give me bullet points. Bullet points. I'll cover them all. Oh my well, gosh! I love the. Oh, I'm sorry. I love the title of this podcast, "Drinking with Authors." So going back to meeting Hemingway. After I have a few, we can do that again because <laughs> I might just meet him later on. <laughs> exactly. Oh no, you're you guys. I'm going to have you guys on my podcast individually. We can oh, get I hope so. I would love to be on. Soaring draw. I will reach out to you. You'll have your own episodes, absolutely. And then anytime you guys have a book releasing, just reach out to me. I'd love to have people on again. It's not a one and done. I see Barbara. I, August twenty third. August twenty third. <laughs> August twenty third. Look, I'm reaching out. 
reaching out to you. You see, I see. I, see. I, I will have you. No, this has been so much fun. You guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for being here. This has been Drinking with Authors. Our sponsor has been Skunk Brother Spirits. DWA10 is the coupon code. And we will see everyone next time. <laughs>